Nobody got blown away? I'll tell you what, that was something else. The winds are blowing. Well, let's uh, bow our head this morning before we start adult Sunday school and just talk to God for a minute. Lord, we thank you, Lord, for the opportunity, oh God, to, to be here today, Lord. We um, are excited to hear your word. Uh, we're thankful for abundant life, God, and um, even though we're not perfect, oh God, you are, and you help us. You give us grace, oh God, to, to grow, oh God. You give us grace to um, put up with one another when we make mistakes, oh God. Lord, thank you for the church of the living God, Lord, where we can grow and know you, and we thank you in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. Amen. Well, we are continuing in Romans. And um, I only am going to cover three or four, maybe four or five scriptures today because I could not stop writing about them. So I'm not going to make as much ground as I normally do, but that's okay. Um, just a quick review. Um, I've been doing this review uh, before each um, teaching here just because it helps me um, understand what I'm, you know, talking about because after... 20 years of studying God's Word, if you just dive into some scriptures and read them and you don't really know the context, you don't get the full, you don't get the full meal. You know what I'm saying? And uh, for me, I read a book that Brother Dieter gave me years ago, um, and it uh, talks about the overarching big picture of scripture, and I actually forget the name of it at the moment, but... It really opened my eyes that we really need to look at the big picture when we dive into uh, specific scriptures. Um, and there's so many people and so many denominations out there and, and so many teachings out there that they, they build doctrines because they, uh, they don't look at the big picture and they build false doctrines. So I always you know, want to advise everybody to look at the big picture. Uh, one scripture in the Old Testament says, line upon line, Precept upon precept. Amen. Here a little, there a little. So today we are going to look at the big picture quickly. Chapter 1 um, gives us our theme for the whole book of Romans, the just shall live by faith. And we've, uh, we've talked about that and talked about that and talked about that. So I'm, I'm hoping that everybody that's here under the sound of my voice is getting a clear picture of what it means to, um, to be justified by faith and not by works. Um, chapters 2 and 3 talks about um, self-righteousness and universal sin. I think everybody should have a good concept of what that stuff is or what those teachings are. Uh, chapter 4 gives us an example of someone living by faith, being justified by faith, and everybody remembers that as being uh, Abraham. Um, he had no law. He lived before Moses. He did not have the Ten Commandments. He did not have the 613 written laws. Um, but he was considered a friend of God because of the, his relationship with God and his obedience. Um, chapters 4, verse 5 says, But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Amen. That was a key scripture in uh, chapter 4. Chapter 5 talks about the benefits of being justified by faith. And um, there was a long list that I put together, but some of those key things, some of those key benefits that we have when we live by faith is peace with God, um, hope. Um, one of my favorite is being able to glory in tribulations. And um, that's something that God's been working on in my life in the last few years. He's really been teaching me to glory in tribulations. Has any, does God work with you on those situations? Amen. Amen. And what, man, that's, just, that's so powerful because before I came to God, there was no glory in any tribulation. Amen. Uh, any tribulation that came my way, I had to deal with that with drugs or alcohol or shutting my mind off through entertainment or, or whatever, um, bad relationships. But now that we are the children of God, by faith, amen, we can glory in tribulations. And... Um, we have to become tribulation proof, and we talked about that when we went through chapter 5. Um, chapter 6 talks about 
Paul teaches us about the abuse of grace. Grace can be abused. And because we are no longer under the law, we don't have a strict set of rules. Amen. That does not give us a license to be um, wild animals and do what we want. It does not give us the... Uh, um, does not give us the license to sin, is what he talks about in chapter 6. So we don't have a license to sin. Um, We owe it to God, amen, to listen to the Spirit and follow the Spirit. But we don't have a strict set of rules over us anymore, so there's liberty in Christianity now. There's a liberty to to grow with God and to follow Him. Um, When you're under a strict set of rules, there is no liberty in in that in that aspect, I mean, it's, it's, it's legalistic. And if you mess up, you're in trouble. And condemnation sticks in uh, or creeps in right away. So there is no condemnation to those that walk after the Spirit. If I, if I mess up, I know that I didn't break a law, but I do know that I, I, I did let down my Father in heaven who expects more out of me. Okay? Um, I'm not serving the law. The law is not my master, but the God of grace and mercy is my master, and he loves me, and he's given me time to to grow. Um, I remember when I, just a quick little example, and I'm I'm probably going to get off track here, but I feel the Spirit leading me in this way. When my children were very small, two of them have already been able to mow my yard. Two of them are too small. Charlie and Eliza don't use my riding lawnmower yet, so... I don't need children, family services coming after me. I want you all to know that. But Charlie, at a, or Carter, at a very young age, would mow the yard. He wanted to mow the yard. So I said, okay, you know, mow it. And he scalped it quite a few times, scalped it hard. I didn't come down on him for breaking the law because it's against the rules to scalp my yard. I love my lawn. I have a nice lawn. I, I, on my street, I'm the only one that has a lawn. Everybody else has cactus and weeds, and they blow in my, my yard. And they try to infest my yard, and I hate that. But I put a lot of money into my lawn. I, ha- I have over an acre of land, and I-, I irrigate it with city water, and it's very, very expensive. I love my lawn. And my son scalped it. I didn't come after my son. I patted him on the shoulder. I gave him 20 bucks. I said, you did a good job, but I need you to raise that mower deck next time you go over my lawn. <laughs> Amen? And I think that's the definition of grace. Amen. It's not a strict set of rules. Amen. And um, I didn't have to yell at him and point my finger at him and make him feel bad and make him feel like he was a loser and like he was, you know, like he was worthless. Amen. But there was some correction there in the spirit of grace, and that's what God does for us. Uh, Chapter 7 talks about the struggle between the flesh and the spirit. And, you know, contrary to some teaching out there, no matter how how much you try, you are going to fight the flesh all the way up until Jesus Christ comes back. It's not going to end. You will get victory over the flesh, and you will move on to different battles. Amen? Um, If we're struggling in a certain area, we need to conquer that area through the power of the Spirit, and we need to move on to the next battle. You don't want to be stuck on the same battleground, on the same front, your whole entire Christian life. Um, and, And Paul talks about that. Um, we can't, I haven't figured out how to be in the spirit 100% of the time. Amen. I strive to, to be with God all the time, but there's times where I slip, I slip out of that mindset and out of that, out of that walk and I mess up and I, I get going down the wrong path and I have to grab myself and shake myself. God has to grab me and, you know, and shake me up and get me back on the right path sometimes. So there is a struggle between the spirit and the flesh. And don't feel ashamed if you make some bad choices. Don't feel ashamed if you start to head down the wrong path because we all do that. And Paul talks about that in 7. And, uh, but the Spirit did come to present us blameless and spotless for, uh, for the coming of Jesus Christ. That's, the Spirit is perfecting us. And there's scriptures about be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. Amen? So we are, we are on a path of perfection Amen. We're not ever going to, we can get to a place where God is pleased with us. We can get to that place of perfection. Amen. Uh, That doesn't mean perfect like Christ, 
but it means that God is getting us to a place where he finds pleasure in us and we, we are found spotless and blameless. Amen. All right, so that is the end of the review. I start last time I was up here, I uh, taught on Romans chapter 8. And some of the themes in chapter 8 is life in the spirit, heirs with Christ and future glory and um, God's everlasting love. So there's four different themes in there. Um, last time I was up here, we talked about life in the Spirit. And uh, I'm sure some of you guys remember some of the things that we talked about. Quick little, uh, little review on that. We talked about there's no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. And Paul taught us that there's an ongoing conflict between the Spirit and the flesh. And in verse 2, he talked about the law of the Spirit and life in Christ Jesus has made us free from the law of sin and death. Um, and when we, when we spoke about that last time, we talked about how our new birth experience be, in water and spirit brings us out of the flesh into the spirit realm. So in John 3, 5, he says, unless you're born of water and spirit, you can't even see the kingdom of God. Okay, and unless you're born of water and spirit, you can't, in, in, you can't enter the kingdom of God. So, that totally blows out the doctrines out there that all you got to do is say a sinner's prayer and you're saved and you've got it figured out um, because that's not the way God set up um, salvation. Salvation begins at the born-again experience of water and spirit. So, in verses 3 and 4 of chapter 8, he talked about what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh. God sent his son in the likeness of sinful flesh to condemn sin in the flesh that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit. Um, we talked a little bit about that last week that the strict observation of the law may give the appearance of righteousness but it does nothing for the internal man. Okay? You can do everything Everything to look right, talk right, dress right. You can, you can do all that. But if you are not born again and God is not living inside of you through a relationship with him, communing with God, um, you will just be clean on the outside and dirty on the inside. And that's not what we want. Um, verses 5 talked about those that are in the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, those that are in the spirit, the, the things of the spirit. That's why it's so important to be spirit-filled and to have a, a prayer language and to, to be filled with God's spirit because if he's inside of us, we will want to do righteousness. If he's not inside of us, we will do what we've always done, and that is sin, okay? I know this is uh, rudimentary stuff for us um, for us in this class today, and but it's important to go over this because there's going to be people coming in our lives that don't know these things. I had two Bible studies last week. Um, my uh, wife's cousin was in town, um, a lady that's coming to our Bible study. Um, who's still she's still attending another church. She's not coming here, but we baptized her. And I'm having I'm having conversations with these people, and these scriptures are coming back up, and they're, they're helping me to to open up. Um, the Lord's helping these folks open up their minds so they can see the truth. Um, to be carnally minded is death in verse 6. To be spiritually minded is, is life and peace. We talked about that. Um, we talked about people out in the world are hell-bent on, on killing themselves through drugs, alcohol, sin, lying, cheating, all that stuff. And they have no other choice. That's their natural inclination is to sin. But those that are born again of water and spirit, they have a natural inclination to do what is right. Um, there's always, we, you guys have seen movies or cartoons where there's a devil on somebody's shoulder and an angel on the other side. There's a lot of truth in that. There is a lot of truth in that. And when we're born again, um, we're muzzling the devil over here and we're, we're really listening to the spirit and he's speaking to us and he's talking to us. Um, See here. Paul goes on to say, but we're not in the flesh, we're in the spirit. And he says, if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin. We talked about that. Verse 11, but the spirit that raised up Jesus from the dead, if it dwell in you, 
He that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies. We talked about that. And I'm just going to have to kind of skip forward here and get to the lesson because I like this stuff so much I just want to teach it all again. Amen. This is, the, book of, uh, the book of Romans has been called like a mini Bible. I mean, God, Paul basically took the whole word of God and he concentrated it into one book. And he, he really um, opens up a lot of stuff in there. So today we're going to start at um, verse 14. Let's go to 14. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. What a wonderful statement made by the apostle here. If we're led by the Spirit, not only will we have abundant life, not only will we live, but we will be the sons of God. I really want to dive into that statement there because I think we, we overlook this, um, this teaching a lot. Colossians 1.13 says, Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son? In that scripture, Paul also wrote Colossians. He's telling us that when we're born again, he's taken us out of the power of darkness under the control of Satan, and he's put us into the kingdom of his dear son, where we are joint heirs with Christ. We are no longer the children of the devil when we are born again, but the children of God. And I, I really don't think we really grasp this, and I really want to talk about this a little bit this morning. We have been brought out from the bondage of Satan. He was our master. He was our father. Amen? John chapter 8, verses 39 through 44, this is a conversation that Jesus had with the religious leaders of that day. They answered and said unto him, Abraham is our father. Jesus saith unto them, If you were Abraham's children, ye would do the works of Abraham. But now you seek to kill me, a man that hath told you the truth which I have heard of God, this did not Abraham. You do the deeds of your father. They said unto him, We be not born of fornication. We have one father, even God. Jesus said unto them, If God, was you, if God were your father, ye would love me. For I proceedeth forth and came from God. Neither came I of myself, but he sent me. Why do you not understand my speech, even because ye cannot hear my word? Ye are of your father the devil. That's, that's, that's something that a lot of people don't understand that, that when they're born into this world, um, they're born under the control of sin. They're born under their, under their father, the devil. Now, little children, my little children are being raised in the church. Your children are being raised in the church. Amen. They are covered by us. They are protected by God. Amen. We confirm our children when they're little. We, we present them before the Lord and say, Lord, protect my children. Basically, we're saying, God, we commit these children to you until the day that they can make the decision for themselves to live for you. But I commit my life to raising them up in the knowledge of the truth. So my children are not the father. Their, their father is not the devil. But I was raised in the world. And um, my mom had some faith, what little faith she had. But um, we use the, we use the expression little hellions. You guys ever heard that? I was probably one of those kids, <laughs> you know, um, <clears throat> but God has, God wants to take us out of the bondage that Satan has us under and take us out from that family and put us in a new family. In first John three, seven, he says, John says, Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. He that committeth sin is of the devil. For the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him. And he cannot sin, because he is born of God. In this the children of God are manifest, and the children of the devil... Whosoever doth, doeth not righteousness is not of God, neither he that loveth not his brother. <clears throat> you can tell by people, you, there's a litmus test, you can, you can tell by people's actions who their master is. And we talked about this earlier in Romans, whoever you yield your members to, that is your master, okay? 
if, if somebody comes and says, you know, God gave me permission to drink and smoke, and God, God really doesn't care about foul language, and God doesn't really care about the way I dress and the way I talk and all this, um, you can see right there who their father is, okay? They've just let, they've just let everything out of the closet, you know? Um, you can see it. You can see the effects of the Holy Ghost in somebody's life, and you can see the effects of the devil in somebody's life. And you can, you can, whoever they're yielding their members to, that is their master. So, and there's a struggle when we come to God where God is pulling us out of that old life. And, and sometimes we, there's things that we're yielding to that we shouldn't be yielding to. So there's, we need to fully commit to what God expects in our life and fully commit to not doing what the devil wants us to do. And there is a transitional period, and I, I believe that goes on, um, that goes on. A lot of it changes right when we're baptized, but there's some things that are hard to let go that they, that's kind of a struggle, but it needs to be let, it, we need to let it go because sin is like a cancer. You can't play with it. Um, so you guys kind of tracking with what I'm saying? Okay. I don't want to build some kind of false doctrine there that allowed sin, but we're not under the law, okay? If we, scalp the, if we scalp the grass, God's not chopping our head off, okay? But we've got to stop scalping the grass. We've, we've, got, to please the, we've got to please our Father, okay? When he says, whoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him... When it's talking about the seed there, it's talking about the Word of God remains in us. Um, that's why we're here this morning studying God's Word, is because we want this seed to stay in our hearts. So that if we go to do something wrong, um, that Word will quicken our minds, our mortal minds, and we'll, we'll know that that is wrong. Um, we may not realize this, but every single day of our life, every single day of everybody's life in here, the Word of God affects us in our actions. When we get up to dress in the morning, the Word of God should affect our actions. When we're, when we're starting to get heated in an argument with somebody, the Word of God should affect our actions. Um, road rage, lying, cheating, whatever. I mean, I could go on and on. That seed should be affecting our decisions on a constant basis. And... If, you, if, if, you're, if, you're, if you're sinning and you feel like it's okay to do it, it, I, it, to me it seems like you're not reading your word enough because the word is flush with instructions on every single subject of our life. Every single decision that we make, there is multiple, multiple, multiple scriptures about what we should do in every situation. So study your word of God. If you have questions about the way you present yourself, go to the Word of God. If you have questions about how you should have relationships with your brothers and sisters, go to the Word of God. Let that seed remain in you so that you do not sin. All right, moving on to verse 15. For you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Here Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, tells us that fear is now a thing of the past and that the born-again believer, is, is, his fear is being completely replaced by a feeling that an orphan gets on the day that somebody shows up at the orphanage, orphanage and picks him up. Okay, that was a long description there, but I want to I get this across to you guys. Before... Before, before the gospel came into our life and before we gave our life to God, we lived in, a, we lived in a, a spirit of fear. And we may cover up that fear with um, drugs, alcohol, maybe lies, maybe relationships, um, whatever. We cover, we cover it up and we numb ourselves from the fear. Amen. But we have not... God did not come to give us that fear again. He took the law out from above, above our heads. He took, he took the punishment away on the cross, and he gives us grace. And, 
Everybody take a deep breath. Thank you, God, for grace. Thank you, God, for grace. God has given me, he's given me the room to grow. He's given me the grace. If I, if I scalp the yard, thank you, Jesus. He's not, he's not going to kill me. Amen. He's going to help me do better. Okay, so we don't have the spirit of bondage again to fear, but we have the spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Hebrew slaves, Hebrew slaves were not allowed to call their master's father. It was against the rules. In the same way, um, you wouldn't just walk into somebody's house that you just met and call their father, father. You would say, yes, sir. Or, you know, you'd be very kind to that person. You'd say, yes, sir. But you wouldn't, you wouldn't just cry. I, I, you know, I wouldn't walk up to any of your fathers and say, hey, dad, what's going on? You know, we, I don't have that liberty. But the scripture says we cry, Abba, Father, denoting that the adoption that happens when we're born again of water and spirit produces this emotional response where we feel like we can call Jesus Christ our Father. We can call God our Father, same person. Amen. I feel like I have a dad now. Before I was baptized, um, I, I did not feel like God was my father. I felt like he was somebody very distant. I knew of him, but, um, but now I really, I really do feel like God is my father. And I hope you guys all feel that way too. And I know you do. And if you, if you struggle with that, if you struggle with that, I... I as God, with that identity with God, I'm reassuring you today that He has a father and son relationship with all of you and that He cares for you. Um, I was reading in a commentary by Adam Clark, and there was a small little portion of his commentary on this scripture, and it really, really was so good, all I had to do was copy and paste it and put it in here. I didn't even have to put it in my own words, which I really like to do. It makes me, it makes me look smart. But I, I totally plagiarized his commentary. Listen to this. Adoption was an, act of, was an act frequent among the ancient Hebrews, Greeks, and Romans, by which a person was taken out of one family and incorporated with another. Persons of property who had no children of their own adopted those of another family. The child thus adopted ceased to belong to his own family and was in every respect bound to the person who adopted him, as if he were his own child. And in consequence of the death of the adopting father, he would possess his estate. If a person, after he had adopted a children, happened to have children of his own, the state would be equally divided between the adopted children and the real children. Wow. Wow. That is an amazing, amazing thing that I just read. This is what adoption produces. Adoption produces a new name, a new family, a new character, and a new inheritance. This is what adoption separates us from. It separates us from our old name, our, own, our old character, our old family, and our old inheritance. Now, going back to verse 15, we, we have the spirit of adoption now. Amen? All of us, we have this spirit of adoption where we have a new name, a new inheritance, a new family, and a new character. <clears throat> Romans 16, 8, 16 says, The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. I love, love, love this scripture. I love it. And I want you guys all to love it as much as I do. When it says beareth witness, the Greek word for beareth witness is to collaborate with another witness. It means to collaborate. If there was a trial and they brought multiple witnesses into a trial, you would want those witnesses to speak the same thing that you could get a conviction. Okay? So that's, that's what Paul is writing in here. Is, is that's the, that's the uh, idea that he's wanting to get across to us, that the Spirit of God is co co collaborating with our spirit 
for one testimony. And I want to talk about a few things that the Spirit collaborates with us so that we know that we are the children of God. And the four things that I wrote down, there might even be five here, um, tongues, supernatural provision, vision and dreams, and chastisement and suffering. And I want to talk about those things um, in a little detail here. The constant interaction between God's spirit and our spirit is the evidence of our family tie. Okay? I want to start with speaking in tongues. When I see two people walking down the uh, street speaking in a language that I don't know, um, it's usually Spanish, um, but I've heard all kinds of languages. I've seen Africans, I've seen, you know, Chinese, I've seen all kinds of people speak in languages, and I don't understand what they're saying. I, I try to guess, especially with the Spanish stuff, I, I, I can guess a little bit because I've been around it so much, but... These are things that I realize when I see two people speaking in a different language. They're from a different land. Or they have origins of a different land. They have a different culture and community. They're speaking the language of their parents. They, you learn your language from your parents. And the definition of language is the principal method of communication consisting of words used in a structured and conventional way to convey that convey speech, they're conveyed by speech, writing, or gesture. They are used by a particular country or community. So when we speak in tongues after we're born again, it's because we've been adopted into a new family. Okay? In 1 Corinthians 13, it says, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I become a sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal. When you speak in tongues, you are speaking in the tongues of angels. You are speaking in your father's language. Amen? You have been adopted into a new family, and thus God wants you to speak a new language. Amen? If, uh, if, I, was, uh, if I was five years old, and I was adopted by an African family and brought to Africa... I would be expect to speak their language in order to, to get by and to, 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 to live. Uh, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't suffice just to live by my own language. So speaking in tongues is the evidence of an interaction with something supernatural and otherworldly. In Acts chapter 2, it says, When the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all in one accord in one place, and there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind. I told Sister Halen a minute ago that I had that in my notes today after that weather we had yesterday. I think anybody should preach a sermon on Acts chapter 2 with that rushing mighty wind. My house about blew off its foundation yesterday. But there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire, and it set upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave utterance. It is God in heaven that gives us the ability to speak this new language. Um, I want you guys to notice, where did the sound of the rushing mighty wind come from? It came from heaven. And it set upon each of them. And they were filled with the Holy Ghost. And they began to speak with other tongues. When you're filled with the Holy Ghost, you begin to speak with a new language. And I've talked with many, many people over the years about the reason why God chose tongues as the initial evidence of the Holy Ghost. Is, and this is the reason, and there's scripture to back this up. The first thing you want to do when you want to tame something is you've got to get a hold of its mouth. And the book of James tells us this. If you want to tame a horse, you've got to put a bit in its mouth. If you want to control a ship from wrecking, you've got to put a rudder on the ship. Amen? God is a very wise individual. Amen? He, he doesn't come in and grab your hands when you're baptized in Jesus' name and, he, and make you do righteousness. He doesn't direct your feet to do the, uh, the right thing right away. What he does is he, get a, he gets a hold of your tongue because if he can get a hold of your tongue, he's got the whole body. Amen? So... Is 
The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. If I was to stop speaking in tongues, I, I would lose my ever-living mind. I would lose it. Because I believe with all my heart that the Spirit of God would depart from me if I wasn't able to communicate with my God. If I came home and my wife was not in the house and my kids were not in the house making noise and it was silent, I would lose my mind. Where is my family? Where is the noise of my family? Where are their voices? It is the same way with tongues. We need to hear the voice of God in our spirit. I need confirmation that God is working in my life. I encourage everybody to pray, pray in tongues as much as you can. Not, not in the visitor's ear when they walk in the door. Don't spit in their eardrum. That's not going to help. Amen. But there, there's, there's times when we can pray in the church in tongues and not offend somebody. In 90, 99% of the places you can. There's one place where you could offend somebody, and that's getting right in their face and speaking in tongues. That's not what they need to hear. Okay, that's another study. We're not going down that road. The next thing that the Spirit bears witness with our spirit is supernatural provision. Who here loves the provision of God? Psalms 37, 25. I have been young, and now I am old. Yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. Isn't that beautiful? God takes care of his children. God has taken care of us. Second Peter 1, 3. According as his divine power hath given us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue. You could take that one scripture there and, and preach multiple sermons, but the main thing I want to get out of 2 Peter 1, 3 there is God has given us everything we need that pertains to this life and godliness. Godliness is the, the attribute of being like God, being like God's character, having his character. 1 Timothy 5.8 says, But if any, if any provide not for his own, and especially those of his own house, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. Okay, this, this teaching comes from God, so I have to assume that's the way God feels about his children. Would you all agree? God, God is not an infidel. God cares for us, and God wants to provide for us. Uh, Matthew 7, 11, If then you, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your own children, how much more shall your Father, which is in heaven, give good gifts to them that ask Him? I do see people in the church struggle in a lot of areas, and I believe this is the reason, is because they're either afraid to ask God for help, they have too much pride, or, or they're, so, they've got, they're, they're riding the fence and they're, they're living for the devil and they're li trying to live for God at the same time. And because of that, they don't have a relationship with God and they lack the understanding that, to, to lean on God for provision. And God really, you know, if, if, you've got, if you've got your hands in both sides of the, you know, the fence, you've got your feet on both sides of the fence, you know, God's probably going to be a little less likely to help you out when you ask for help. I really believe that. There's a scriptures in there that says, strengthen not the hands of evildoers. And I, I've learned my lesson over the years. There was, there was men that came into my life that were, that were drug addicts and, and alcoholics and liars, and they would ask me for help. And I would, oh, God, I'll help you, whatever you need. You know, I'll put you up in a hotel. I'll, here's a $100 bill. You know, go, go, go get you some food. And, and, and then calamity would come on my life. Because you got to be careful who you help, you know, because if they don't want to help themselves, you can't help them. They don't need money. They need the gospel. Okay? The third thing I want to talk about, the Spirit beareth witness with our spirit, is visions and dreams. Peter had visions. Paul had visions. Jacob, Daniel, Cornelius, everybody in this room, I'm sure, has had some visions in their life and some dreams. And if you haven't, you should ask God for that. Um, don't be scared. Ask God to speak to you. 
In Joel chapter 2, verse 28 and 29, it says, And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and daughters shall prophesy, your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions. And also upon my servants and upon my handmaids in those days will I pour out of my spirit. So God gives us tongues. He gives us a new language. He gives us provision. He gives us visions and dreams. Um, there's a scripture that says, without a vision, my people perish. We, we got to have a vision. And that's why we have books like Daniel and Revelation is because God has prepared us for the things that are coming so that we understand and we have a hope of glory. We have a hope of, a future hope of what's going to happen. Amen? Um, I think of the prodigal son. He took his inheritance ahead of time, which is an awful thing. But he knew he had an inheritance. He knew that there was some money coming to him, and he just jumped the gun. And... I know, we all know in this room that we have an inheritance coming. The Holy Ghost is only a down payment of what's to come. So we, God gives us a new language. He gives us provision. He gives us dreams and visions. And this is the, uh, one of the last things I put in here, chastisement and suffering. And, it, and it's, in, it's important to know that when, you know, Brother Dieter talks about the, uh, the sound of the belt coming out of the the loops on the pants, you can hear every little loop as the belt comes out. And he, he's talked about it many times, how God has chastised him. And that's our pastor. You know, we can all admit, too, that we've been chastised. Amen? There's times in my life where I couldn't hear God's voice very clearly. And that's, sometimes that's, that's, a, that's a form of God trying to get our attention. Hey, child, you're getting a little too far away from me. That's why you can't hear my voice. Um, maybe, maybe the provision isn't where it needs to be, and we've struggled pay, paying our bills, and we've, you know, and, and, I, and you may be close to God and still struggle pay your bills. I'm not trying to say that that's a litmus test, but you know what I'm saying. Sometimes the help is just not there like it should be, and you know why it's not there. It's because you've wandered away from the, the hand that feeds you. Amen. There's a saying out there, never bite the hand that feeds you. So, I don't know where that came from, but can't bite God's hand. But, and suffering, you know, suffering goes in there too. Um, we've, got, we've, got to, we've got to suffer if we're going to know God. And actually, that goes a little bit more with 17, and I'm almost done here. Let's read verse 17. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. I love this scripture because it talks about the oneness of God here, really clearly. Because it says heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. Now, if you weren't a spirit-filled person, you would think, wow, there's two different people there and two different, um, two different uh, inheritances that I'm going to receive. But if you know the scriptures, it's talking, it's talking about the same thing. It's talking about the same person. In John 14, 6, Jesus said unto them, or Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. In John 10, 9, Jesus said, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. In order to get to God, you've got to go through Jesus Christ. And the reason that is, is because God had to manifest himself in a human body in order to get our attention, because we're so small and insignificant compared to God, that the only way that we can relate to God is if he comes down out of heaven and he manifests himself in a way that we can understand him. Okay? God's ways are above our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. His ways are not our ways. Amen? Amen. So if any man think himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. All right, so God manifested himself in a body. It said, to wit, God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself. If you guys, uh, we don't have that scripture up there, but I want you guys all to remember that scripture. 
to wit, God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. Not, not unto somebody else. God came out of heaven, went into Christ to bring everybody in the world back to God, back to himself. God was, Jesus was just a, an expressed image of the invisible God. God manifested in flesh. Romans 8, 17. What a great oneness uh, scripture. But there's a little clause at the end of that. And if children, if we are the children, then we are the heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. We have to be joint heirs with Christ in order to be heirs with God because Christ suffered. Okay? And we have to suffer as Christ suffered so that we can be glorified together. And I am out of time here. This is my last scripture. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted the prophets which were before you. You may not have to die on a cross like Jesus died. You may not have to be hung upside down like Peter was hung upside down. But you are going to have to deny your flesh and take up your cross. Amen. You are going to have to... You are, when you're around your family, you're going to have to be true to what you believe, even though you're going to be persecuted. Most of my family does not agree with what I believe in, and they make that apparently clear. And it's like a knife in the heart, amen, because you want them to feel what you're feeling. You want them to have the joy that you have, but great is our reward in heaven, amen. Amen. So next time I come up uh, next month, we'll start at verse 18. And we'll talk about the future glory, amen, that God has for us. Um, and that'll be verses 18 through 30. But we are done for today. Be, um, you know, the Bible says do the work of an evangelist. There's going to be people here today um, that are watching our every move. There's people that are going to come in that have been church hopping, Amen. They're looking for something that's real and authentic. Amen. And we have been adopted into God's family. Amen. So let's show them what it feels like to not be an orphan and to be adopted. Amen. Hope you all enjoyed Romans 8 there. And Lord bless you all in Jesus' name.